At the beginning of the video lecture that I put up the other day on the subject of transference, um, I indicated that uh, some psychoanalytic writers uh, consider countertransference to really be merely the analyst's transference to the patient. So countertransference being just transference, um, it really doesn't require uh, independent discussion. Now, um, I seem to agree with that, and I'm not sure why I indicated agreement with that, because I do not agree with that. Um, that refers to only one type of countertransference, namely uh, what has been called the subjective countertransference as opposed to the objective and the induced countertransferences. So uh, we have to envisage a continuum or what Freud called a complemental series. Um, with the understanding that in reality we rarely encounter a pure type. So take the complemental series between uh, heredity and environment. We rarely encounter something that is entirely hereditary or hereditarily determined and we uh, rarely encounter something that is purely environmentally caused uh, so we rarely encounter uh, the extremes of, of the two poles. What we generally encounter is uh, some mixture. It may be 20% heredity and 80% environment, or vice versa. So we have the complemental series with various positions. This is dimensional then, not categorical. Um, so let's apply this, uh, as Winnicott did, really, to the subject of countertransference, a complemental series between, at one extreme, the purely subjective countertransference, and at the other, the objective and the induced countertransferences. Now, what do we mean by the subjective countertransference? Um, this would be the analyst's transference to the patient coming from the analyst's own personal subjectivity, from his own uh, personality, from his own past object relations, which he is transferring onto the patient, and uh, to a greater or lesser extent, uh, distorting um, the reality of the patient by seeing the patient through the screen of his own subjectivity, of his own object relations, of his own past. So that's the subjective countertransference, and the idea is that that should be eliminated as much as possible through the analyst's own personal analysis, so that he becomes very familiar with his particular uh, tendencies, uh, proclivities, uh, to uh, find a mother in his patient, or a father in his patient, or a brother, or a sister in his patient. If he becomes aware of these tendencies, um, he's in a position to correct for this, and to separate his perception of the reality of the patient from his own uh, distorting lenses. Okay, that's the subjective countertransference. Uh, at the other end of the complemental series, or the continuum, is what Winnicott called the objective countertransference. Uh, we don't hear much about this um, these days. What did he mean by it? He meant the kind of reaction that anyone would have to this particular patient. In other words, the analyst's reaction is not unique to him. Uh, most psychoanalysts would have the same feelings uh, stirred in them uh, by an encounter with this particular person. Uh, so he calls it objective in the sense that um, instead of 
um, coming from his own subjectivity, it's objective. It's 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 in the sense appropriate. It's not unique to him, um, because any analyst would 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 have similar feelings evoked by an encounter with that patient. Um, okay, uh, that makes a certain amount of sense. Um, but what is much more interesting, and uh, I think nowadays what is much more general among psychoanalysts is um, uh, a continuum, a complemental series, uh, where at one pole we have the subjective countertransference, and at the other pole, instead of the so-called objective, uh, countertransference, we have the induced countertransference. This is a countertransference that is evoked in the analyst or induced in the analyst by the patient's use of projective identification. Uh, and uh, here we're talking about projective identification type 2. I talk about type 1 and type 2 projective identification because Melanie Klein meant something quite different from what Wilfred Bion came to mean by projective identification. A lot of people uh, nowadays overlook this and they, 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 they haven't read Klein carefully enough to notice that her usage differs uh, significantly because Klein really in an important way, remained a one-body theorist, whereas Bion took the step into two-body theorizing. In other words, for Melanie Klein, projective identification uh, was not an interpersonal process. Um, for her, it meant A's fantasy that parts of himself now reside in B. She was not at all interested uh, or not at all saying anything about the effect that this might have on B. She was focused on A, not on B. Uh, and she focused on A's fantasy that parts of himself, um, parts of his internal world, perhaps his feelings, perhaps images of self, perhaps images of others, now reside in B through projection. But that's a fantasy. That's A's fantasy. Uh, and it's very important in the analysis of A to understand his fantasies, including his fantasies of what he has, quotes, put into others. Uh, apparently, uh, one day a supervisee of Klein's came to her and said that his patient had put her confusion into him. He meant that by projective identification, the confused patient was evoking confusion in him. Now that's an interpersonal uh, concept of projective identification. Klein said, no dear, you're confused. In other words, uh, don't go attributing your confusion, which is your problem, to your patient. Uh, she didn't put any, anything into you. You've got a confusion problem that you need to sort out. Now, the Freudians, for a very long time, had a real problem with projective, the concept of projective identification because they said that it in the interpersonal version of it, uh, that it invited patient bashing. That is, blaming the patient for the analyst's countertransference problem, subjective countertransference problem. What do you do with a subjective countertransference? If you can't simply overcome it through self-understanding, you, you, you go back into analysis for a while uh, in order to work this through.
so the Freudians were arguing that the concept, Beyond's concept of projective identification as a two-person process whereby A, first in fantasy, puts something of the self into the other, but then secondly takes the step to induce or evoke that in the other. It's kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy. First I imagine that my hate, which I don't want to know about, is in you. And then I conduct myself towards you in such, as, in such a way as to actually stimulate your hate and validate my perception. Okay, that's interpersonal projective identification, two-body psychology. That's beyond. That is not Melanie Klein. Okay, in relation to this two-person process uh, idea, um, the Freudians felt that this was... Um, a concept that would lead analysts to be blaming their countertransference on the patient. The patient put it into me, the patient stirred it up in me or evoked it in me, when in reality it's my subjective problem and I should be working it out in my own analysis. That was the Freudian. Uh, but that's, they were really addressing Beyond. They were really not addressing Melanie Klein because Melanie Klein agreed with them, shared their concern. No dear, you're confused, she said. Don't go blaming your patient. Deal with your own subjective countertransference confusion. Okay, uh, not all countertransferences are subjective. Not all countertransferences can be reduced to the analyst's subjective transferences onto the patient coming from his own personal subjectivity. There's a continuum. Most countertransferences are a blend. They are not at either pole of the continuum. They're somewhere in between. Some countertransferences come 80%, say, from my subjectivity. And if they persist and they don't yield easily to understanding, then I need to go back into analysis in order to understand the roots of of my proclivity to be constantly transferring stuff from myself and my past onto my patient. So let's say in this instance the countertransference is 80% uh, coming from me and only 20% being induced by the patient. But some countertransferences are like 80% induced by the patient and only 20% coming from me. I mean the patient uh, has to find a hook in me in order to do the projective identification, to, to do the emotional induction, the patient has to find something in me to hang it on. And so 20% of it, say, comes from me, but maybe 80% or 90% or 70% is coming from what the patient is doing, interpersonal projective identification. Um, this certainly exists, interpersonal projective identification. It's not anything mystical. Unfortunately, the Kleinians for quite a number of years used this language of, he put his envy into me, which sounds magical, like some transpersonal process. Nothing magical about it. Uh, it's actually very simple. Um, to take one example, um, the patient comes in and says, whoa, did you get out of the wrong side of the bed today? What's, what's wrong with you? And I'm saying, what? what? What are you talking about? And he says, well, you're, you're obviously angry about something. You got a bee in your bonnet, obviously. And I'm feeling, what? I've uh, seen three other patients this morning and I'm Fine, nothing radically different as I'm uh, patient and said, oh, come off it. Of course, it's so obvious. Look at the way you just answered me. Look at the way you just denied what I'm saying. You're obviously angry. By this point, I'm starting to get angry. There's the projective identification. Now, who is this guy telling me that he knows my psyche more than I know it myself? I'm getting irritated and I'm getting angry. He's evoking the anger in me uh, that, that he 
seeks to induce through projective identification unconsciously. This is entirely an unconscious process for him. Okay, that's how projective identification works. Uh, it's quite simple, nothing magical about it. Uh, another example, um, a woman is upset. Uh, she's uh, struggling with uh, some sadness or some depression. She, it's an agitated depression and she's got her baby with her and she comes home and she props the baby in his little chair and she proceeds to uh, start to make dinner. And uh, in the course of this she's opening and closing, slamming cupboard doors and she's reaching for pots and pans and it's quite a racket she's making to the extent that the baby suddenly starts crying and mother immediately relaxes because the baby is doing her crying for her. She's projectively identified her agitated state into the, pa into the baby and, 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 and now that the baby is crying mother can relax. Okay, that's interpersonal projective identification. It's very common, it works. Uh, uh, you can't understand a marriage. Uh, certainly marital therapists need to have a good grasp of this because this goes on in couples all the time. Uh, narcissistic men marry depressed women because they can projectively identify their depression, their sadness, their dependency, their fear. They can project that all into their wife and she carries it for them and uh, they can walk around feeling strong and manly and so on and so forth. Uh, meanwhile, the wife is projectively, uh, projectively identifying her aggression, her assertiveness, etc. into him. And uh, so now each of them can be half a person. Uh, um, not a good situation, uh, but you can see elements of this in most marriages and a lot of it in um, unhealthy marriages. Okay, um, so on the subject of countertransference, I think it is certainly not true that um, that countertransference is merely the analyst's transference onto the patient. Uh, that's the subjective countertransference. Those exist. It's important that the analyst understand this. But the truth is that some countertransferences come more from the patient. They, they have more to do with what the patient is doing to me than merely stemming from my subjectivity. Now my subjectivity is going to be in, involved. For the patient to do it to me, they have to find something in me. They have to find a hook. Uh, but the resulting countertransference is no longer merely about my subjectivity. In a major way, it's about the patient's subjectivity. And the patient's need to download some of his or her subjectivity into me and to get me to contain it and carry it and sometimes uh, to be able to interpret it. Now there are many subcategories of projective identification. Um, my topic uh, here is not projective identification, it's countertransference. So uh, I'll just mention that m fairly mild projective identifications uh, are useful um, uh, in communicating to the analyst, who the patient is. Um, he communicates what it's like to be him by um, putting some of his feelings into me. Uh, so now I know what it's like to be him because I'm feeling what he feels because he has put projective, he has used projective identification, interpersonal, to put some of his feelings into me. This aids my empathy. So that's communicative projective identification. It's useful in the analytic process. It, 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 it uh, undergirds uh, uh, empathy. Um, but then there's evacuative projective identification. He can't stand what he's feeling. Uh, he has to put it out like the garbage. Um, put it in a container. 
out by the curb. <laughs> and I'm the container. Um, and uh, so he leaves the session feeling great and I'm left feeling shitty. Um, it's like a bowel movement. It's like a good dump. And he has dumped these feelings he doesn't want to have into me. Um, okay, uh, uh, this goes on. Um, um, both of these kinds of projective identification um, go on and we need to understand this. So countertransference cannot be reduced to a product of the analyst's subjectivity, his transferences. Uh, counter some, sometimes the countertransference is more induced or evoked. So we have that continuum. How much of it is from me? How much of it is being stirred in me by the patient? And this is a problem of discernment. That's a concept from uh, theology. Uh, if I hear a voice saying, uh, Abraham, take your son Isaac up to the top of the mountain and sacrifice him, uh, well, I got a big problem of discernment. Um, who is this Abraham? Is he talking to someone else? Is he talking to me? And uh, how do I know um, who this voice is coming from? Is it God? Is it the devil? This is a problem of discernment. Uh, so, so here, vis-a-vis -vis countertransference, we have a big problem of discernment. I'm having these feelings. Are these coming from me, mainly from my neurosis, from my unresolved issues, from my mother-father-sibling transferences? Is that what's going on? Or are these feelings somehow being dumped into me or evoked in me by the patient. Now I think it's usually both to some degree, but sometimes it's very much more the one than the other. And part of analytic work is this ongoing effort to sort this out, to discern how much is me, how much is the patient in terms of my so-called countertransference reactions. Okay. I wanted to correct what I said at the beginning of the video lecture on transference, where I seemed, for some bizarre reason, don't ask me why, I seemed to go along with the idea that uh, countertransference is merely the analyst's transference. Not so. Uh, some of countertransference is exactly that, but a lot of countertransference. Uh, has a lot to do with projective identification by the patient. So I don't entirely uh, agree with Melanie Klein when she says to her supervisee, no dear, you're confused. Well, I mean, that may have been perfectly true in that situation, but um, Beyond made an important contribution in supplementing Klein's type of projective identification, type one, the patient's fantasy, from projective identification type 2, where the patient induces, through his or her fantasy, induces um, his or her feelings in the analyst. It's real. It occurs. It's important to understand it.